Hello everybody, this video is going to be the first video in our Electrochem chapter. This is the last chapter of the school year. We are almost done. We're going to start by going over some basic concepts, vocab. We're going to learn how to balance reactions in this chapter. It's a little more complicated than balancing a normal reaction. Later on in the chapter, we will start looking at electrochemical cells, things like batteries, and how those work to convert chemical energy into electrical energy or vice versa. So first, a couple of mnemonics. These mnemonics are going to cover the same thing. It's just a personal preference, which one you prefer. I was always taught Leo goes Gur, so that's the one I tend to use. But if you prefer to use oil rig, feel free, doesn't matter. So oxidation is when something is losing electrons during a chemical reaction, compared to reduction when you're gaining electrons. So Leo goes Gur helps you remember the definitions for oxidation and reduction. Same thing with oil rig. Even after all these years, I still sketch Leo Goes Gur up at the top of my worksheet when I go to do something because it is so easy to get these terms backwards. And if you get them backwards, you can't do much this chapter. So if you need to jot it down on your paper, you do that. Here are a couple examples. You don't have to lose or gain just one electron at a time. It could be multiple electrons, like you see in the bottom examples of each type. We are not used to writing the electron into the chemical equation. But for this chapter, that's going to be something that's really important to figure out whether the electrons are being lost, produced, or whether they are being gained as a reactant. The first thing we have to learn is how to assign oxidation numbers. This is going to be the charge an atom would have if the compound was broken apart into its ions. This is going to allow us to track where the electrons are moving during the chemical reaction, which is really important for this chapter. Sometimes it's pretty easy to figure them out. Sometimes they get a little more complicated. The thing that's tough is that it feels very similar to assigning formal charge values, but it's not exactly the same. Formal charge is for Lewis structures. Oxidation numbers are for our electrochem and tracking the electrons. So you need to make sure you don't mix and match up these, these um, numbers. So here's an example. Potassium fluoride is a neutral compound. If I were to split that up into the ions, you would see the charges you're used to seeing. And those happen to be the oxidation numbers. We have a plus one and a minus one. The nice thing about oxidation numbers is it is very common for them to have the normal charges you're used to seeing. But there are a whole set of rules because it's not always that straightforward. So you should have a glue-in that walks you through the rules. Any element, even diatomic elements by themselves, would be zero. Monatomic ions would be just have the charge that's on the ion. When you have a binary compound, whichever is more electronegative, whichever element, that one's going to have the charge it would when it's an ion, and then you would work backwards to figure out what the other one would be. Fluorine is always minus one. That's really important because that results in things like oxygen not always following what you would expect. Oxygen you would expect to be a minus two. But if you have oxygen bound with fluorine, you can often end up with the oxygen as a plus two instead. So you will have to always follow this part here with fluorine being minus one and then work backwards to figure out what oxygen would be. Peroxide is another example where oxygen does not follow what you would expect. In a peroxide, oxygen would be a minus one. 
because hydrogen is almost always a plus one. Now, an exception to that would be if it's a metal hydride. If you have it bound with a metal, the metal would get its normal charge, and therefore the hydrogen ends up being a minus one. Groups one and two, your alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals would have their normal charges. Alumina would have its normal plus three. If you have a neutral compound, all of your oxidation numbers need to add up to zero because that compound is neutral. Compared to if you had a polyatomic ion, then you would have to make sure that all your oxidation numbers add up to the charge that's on that polyatomic ion. Assigning oxidation numbers is not incredibly valuable just for the sake of assigning them. It's more that we need them to be able to balance our redox equations, our reduction oxidation equations. These are going to be more complicated than balancing. We will have to balance not just the atoms, but also the electrons. The charge will have to be equal on the reactants and the product side. That may not sound difficult, but there can be lots of steps to get to the point where it's completely balanced properly. My biggest suggestion is use pencil and to use lots of space. Do not try to cram your work. Don't try to do all the math in your head. You would be shocked how many addition mistakes we see. So be methodical and organized and careful. So the steps for balancing these. First, you're going to have to assign the oxidation numbers. And then once you know what the oxidation numbers are, you're going to have to look at the pieces and figure out which elements are being oxidized and which ones are being reduced. The reason for that is that we're going to split our reaction into two halves. We're going to rewrite it with all of the stuff being oxidized in one equation and the stuff being reduced in a separate equation. At this point, we're going to add the electrons to what, whichever side they need to be on. Then you can finally balance the atoms. That's actually going to be a little bit harder than you would expect. We're going to have to do some creative things. Then you can start balancing the charge by adjusting the number of electrons. Then you add your reactions back together. Simplify, see if anything crosses out on each side, and then you have to check. Please double check your answer on these. So let's do an example. When you first look at this equation, it looks a little crazy, doesn't it? Because it's not balanced and we're, we don't even have all the atoms that we need. I know that. That's the goal, is to fix this equation. They will often look like this where they're not correct and you are trying to fix them. So first assign the oxidation states. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can do that part. All right, well chlorine is an element, diatomic element, so it'll have zero. Iodide has a minus one charge, it's monatomic, so it's just gonna be a minus one. There are two chlorines here, but we're just going to think about one at a time. This chloride here has a minus one oxidation number. Over here, oxygen is going to be a minus two. It is not with fluorine. It is not in a peroxide, so it's going to be a minus two. I have three oxygens, which each have a minus two, so that's a total of minus six. And when I add the iodine plus the minus six, the total has to come to minus one, which means that the iodine has to be a plus five. Now, if I were you early on, I would jot down some little notes to yourself, essentially with the rule or the reason why you're giving the numbers you're giving. That will help you learn them and get faster at them. You may also want to do it like a little equation. Some people have luck 
setting this up almost like a little algebra equation. You don't have to, but if it helps you to do something like this, then do it, whatever you need to, to get the right answer. Okay. Now that we know what the oxidation numbers are, we need to stop and ask ourselves, okay, then which, which pieces are being oxidized and which pieces are being reduced? Use our little mnemonic here. What's lost electrons? Well, if I look, my iodide went from minus one to a plus five. So that was oxidized. That was a loss of electrons during this process. Compare that to chlorine, which went from zero to minus one. That was a gain of electrons. Now that I know which things are oxidized and which things are reduced, then I can split it into two halves. I'm not going to have one big giant equation like this. I'm going to break it into two separate parts. I'm going to have one line for oxidation and one line for reduction. So my oxidation was the iodide. And iodine was present in this ion, wasn't it? So that's going to be on the product side over here. Don't worry about the oxygens. Trust me. And then my reduction half is down here. Do you see how I've put blank spots? That's because this oxidation step loses electrons, which means they're being produced over here. And the reduction part is going to gain electrons, so I'm going to need somewhere for the electrons to be on the reactant side. So I'm leaving little blank spots. So next, let's think about this. We went from minus 1 to plus 5. That means there's been a total loss of 6 electrons. The chlorine might be a little trickier because if you think about it, we said it went from 0 to minus 1, but we didn't think about the fact that there were two chlorines yet, did we? Each chlorine goes from 0 to minus 1, which means there's a total gain of two electrons. This is one of the most common types of mistakes I see, is getting the number of electrons wrong. And if the number of electrons are wrong, then everything afterwards ends up wrong. So pay close attention to this step and pay close attention to any coefficients and subscripts that you might see. Okay. All right. Next, we have to balance the atoms. And that's usually not too bad, right? Except for the fact that, did you notice, we had entire elements missing on certain parts, didn't we? We need to think about how we're going to get them back where they belong. Do you remember when I taught you balancing equations way back when in honors chem, we taught you to balance the unique elements first? And oftentimes things like hydrogens and oxygens show up in multiple places and can be a little trickier to balance, so you leave those till the end. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to balance all the normal elements, all the unique things, and then come back and deal with these troublemakers. In order to balance the oxygens, you are going to have to think about what other molecules might be present that contain oxygen. And you have to realize we're doing these reactions in water. And so if you're missing an oxygen from somewhere, the only way to add it is by including a water molecule or more than one water molecule. When you add this water molecule, now your hydrogens won't be balanced. One thing you need to realize is that these reactions are typically done in an acidic environment. And if it's acidic, that means I have H plus floating around as well. So you'll be able to add this to whichever side is necessary to balance your hydrogens. 
So let's give this a try. We have our oxidation one, and we have our reduction one. And if you look, the iodine is balanced, and now down here, I was nice and already did the chlorine for you. Now we have to deal with this oxygen. Do you see how there's three oxygens on the product side? That means I need to get three oxygens over here on the reactant side, but the only way to add oxygens is by adding water molecules. So I've added three water molecules to take care of the oxygen. Now over here, I'm gonna have to add H plus to balance out these hydrogens. Three times two is six. I almost wish we didn't call these balancing redox reactions. I wish we called them completing a redox reaction because the way this was written originally wasn't complete, was it? We didn't have water present. We didn't have our hydrogens present. We didn't have any of those missing pieces. So I think if you imagine that you're trying to finish the reaction and you happen to balance it in the process, it almost makes the steps a little easier to remember, I think, that you're trying to finish it by adding these other compounds. Okay. So the nice thing was we didn't have to do that down here. This one was all ready to go. Now we have to get these back together because we split them apart, didn't we? And if you notice, right now, if I were to add these up, things are going to be a little bit wonky here. What I need to do is I need to think of this almost like a Hess law problem. One of the things I love about doing this at the end of the year is that it feels kind of like a full circle moment. The first thing we ever taught you in AP Chem was Hess's law. And now we're coming right back to that concept that you can manipulate an equation and add the equations together. So the way our reaction halves were written, we did not have equal number of electrons on either side, did we? Let me go back a minute. Here we only had two electrons, but here we had six. That's no good. That's not equal, is it? You can't gain two and produce six. Like, where did the others go? Where, where were the others from? It doesn't work. So what we're going to do is look for the least common multiple between these two reactions, and we're going to multiply by some number. So if I have my two reactions here, what's the least, th what's the smallest thing I can multiply by so that I get the same number of electrons on both sides? It's going to be three, isn't it? If this one just stays as is, and I multiply this by three, then I will end up with six electrons on either side, which is perfect. That's great. We're one step closer. Now what we have to do, kind of like a Hess law problem, is add these equations back together. So all of the reactants will get smushed together and all of the products will get smushed together. And it looks pretty awful, doesn't it? A lot going on here. At this point, once you've added them back together, you want to see if anything cancels. Do you see how there's six electrons on each side? That means we don't have to worry about writing them. This simplifies now. Some people might ask, why, did my, why am I leaving this broken apart? Well, hydrochloric acid's going to break apart in water, isn't it? This is happening in water. So you're going to have to think about those kinds of things. Now you need to stop and you need to check the most important part the part nobody wants to do. I have one iodine, that's good. I have six hydrogens and six hydrogens, three oxygens, three oxygens, six chlorines and six chlorines. Now, 
The other part people forget about. We need to see if the charges are balanced. All together on the left, what's the total charge? It's minus 1. On the right hand side, we have minus 6 plus 6. Those cancel out. And I have a minus 1. So we end up with a minus 1 on both sides. So the charges are also balanced, which is great. Now sometimes this can get a little trickier because if this was not in an acidic solution, if this was in something basic, I wouldn't be able to have H plus bumming around, would I? I would have to adjust this. I wouldn't be finished. I'd have to keep going so that this would reflect a basic environment and not an acidic environment. You can only have this floating around if it's acidic. We'll worry about that later. I'll practice that on our worksheets too but this part's the big deal, getting this far. So like I said, use pencil, use as much space as necessary. You need to stay calm and don't panic, okay? They can get pretty ugly, you can get some crazy coefficients, but it's all the same skill. And if you're stuck, if you've made a small mistake somewhere, the best thing to do is erase it completely and start completely over. If you miscounted somewhere, you're never going to be able to fix it. Just start over. Okay. So just some things to look for that can help you identify your oxidation and reduction when that oxidation number increases, when it's becoming more positive, that means it's lost electrons. This very often happens when you're adding oxygen or you're losing hydrogen. Or if I give you the half reaction, you may even see the electrons as a product. These are just tricks to recognize it faster. Assigning the oxidation numbers and checking what's happening, that's the right way to do it, but this can speed the process up and help focus your attention. And then the reduction is when we're getting a more negative number. You're gaining electrons. Very often you're going to see oxygens being lost, hydrogens being gained, or you may even see the electrons being written as part of the reactants. One of the things that can make this tricky is that we're about to give you some vocab terms that are probably going to make your brain feel all scrambled. We just taught you about oxidation and reduction. And now I'm going to teach you two words that sound very similar, but are kind of backwards. Oxidizing agent. An oxidizing agent is whatever chemical, whatever substance, is making something else oxidize. So the oxidizing agent itself gets reduced because it is oxidizing something else. And a reducing agent is whatever substance reduces the other thing. So the reducing agent will be oxidized itself because it is reducing something else. I think at this point, this is where most students kind of glaze over and feel a little bit scrambled. So use mnemonics, label things, jot it down at the top of your paper so you don't get it backwards during the quiz. Those kinds of things are very helpful. Okay. Also, kind of talking to yourself out loud in sentence form while you're labeling stuff can be very helpful as well. Another mnemonic I'm going to teach you is called anox, 
and red cat. So an ox represents the fact that when we have an electrochemical cell that we build, one of the pieces of that cell is going to be called the anode. That's the electrode where oxidation is happening. That is the part where electrons are being lost. And it's a physical part of the cell that we build. We'll learn more about cells later on. Beakers that we put little electrodes in, okay? Red cat is trying to remind you that reduction is what occurs at the cathode. So the other electrode that we put into our cell is where reduction will happen. In order for this electrochemical reaction to occur, you're going to need a, an oxidation step and a reduction step. You're going to need an anode and you're going to need a cathode. So Leo goes Ger helps you remember the process that's occurring. And then an ox red cat helps you remember the physical parts of the cell where those processes are happening. Okay. Another thing you might come across is that we will be doing some dimensional analysis here. We may want to know what the current is. We may need some conversion factors. So the current is going to be talking about how many electrons are going through your system every second. We call that an amp. We use a big capital A. One coulomb is equivalent to this many electrons. That's a lot of electrons, isn't it? So an amp is the equivalent of this many electrons flowing every second. You can calculate how many electrons are going through based on what the amperage is, based on how many seconds have passed, and we're going to be able to use this to convert to figure out how many grams of something can you make in your electrochemical cell. One thing that's pretty interesting is that this is a real physical process. Sometimes we have to really think about stuff like the surface area. The more surface area that's exposed, the more electrons can flow. So bigger batteries can get bigger currents. So a lot of electrochemical like experiments and stuff, you know, might be people trying to figure out how to increase surface area, how to increase the current that can flow. Maybe they're trying to control how fast it goes. They can do a lot of things. Coming back to the number of electrons that are moving around at a time. You may sometimes hear people talking about the potential difference. That's talking about the difference in potential energy between your reactants and your products. And we will often use volts to deal with that. One volt is one joule of energy per coulomb. So that can be another type of conversion factor, can't it? Sometimes we're having to drive the electrons through the circuit. We're trying to get them to go through. So you may even read where they're talking about pushing the electrons through. This kind of stuff you get into way more in physics. Way more in physics. But sometimes this comes up in the stories of our problems. When we're dealing with this, what we really care about is going to be dimensional analysis. Most of the time we're trying to set up some conversion factors to be able to convert. So here are some examples 
of some of the conversion factors. We just talked about these. Faraday is another one. Faraday is 96,500 coulombs in one mole of electrons. That's another very helpful one because that will help you get to moles. And then once you're at moles, you can start doing things with grams, can't you? Or vice versa. This all comes up in questions where you're doing something called electroplating. When you are trying to use an electrochemical cell, when you're trying to use a redox chemistry to get one metal to be plated onto a different metal. So for example, we may be trying to figure out, okay, if I have a solution of copper ions, can I put a current through there? Can I start getting electricity to go through there? that will turn the ions in the solution into neutral solid copper. Dimensional analysis, that's the other reason I love doing this chapter at the end of the year is we're coming right back to the very first thing you learned in honors chemistry. The first thing you ever learned, right, was dimensional analysis. So we have 15 grams. You know how to go grams to moles. We use molar mass. Now we need to think. Comparing our neutral element to our ion, can you see how many electrons we're off by? One mole of copper is going to need two moles of electrons Every time you want to turn one of these ions into the neutral version, you need two electrons to be gained. Well, where are those electrons coming from? They're coming from the current that we're applying. We've hooked this up to the electricity. We're shoving electricity through the system. The electricity is our electrons flowing, right? So now, do you see up here in our conversion factors something to help us get from moles? Yeah, look right here. One mole is this many coulombs. Now where am I going to go from coulombs to a time, because it's asking how many minutes this will take. Do you see how the problem told you that it was a four amp current? Four amps is going to be the same as four coulombs per second. And we know how to go from seconds to minutes. So I'm going to have to let this run hooked up to the outlet with the electricity flowing for 189.8 minutes. And if I do that, I will be able to turn enough of my ion into the neutral metal so that I get 15 grams worth. Okay. All right, everybody, I know that was a little longer than normal, but you could see there's a lot of random things I got to cover at the beginning so that we can actually do the rest of the chapter moving forward, okay? All right, everybody, that is it. I hope that was helpful. Bye.